Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Ham Nation, episode 21, recorded October 11th, 2011. What radio should I buy? Hi, I'm Pete Pentode. And I'm Tracy Tryo. And we're here to remind you that real radios glow in the dark. And Ham Nation, Nation is, is on, on the air. air. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry about that. I have no control over it. <laughs> Ham Nation is on the air. Hi, everybody. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. I'm the producer for Amateur Radio Video News, that little series of DVDs on documentaries and seminars on for and about ham radio. And joining me in the other monitor, sitting next to the desk there, is uh, George Thomas, W5JDX. Hey, George, good, good evening. Hey, Gary, good to see you again tonight. And boy, what a show we have. Everyone's out of town, and we've got a free reign here. We are going to carry the show ourselves tonight, and we've got a lot of neat stuff to do. Um, we've got, uh, well, the bulk of the show is going to be what we were promising over the past couple weeks, which is where I, an expert on this subject, will be talking about what radio you should buy, and we're talking about VHF FM radios, you know, handy talkies and mobile radios, and how to program them. We'll get to as much as we can about that. And for those of you on the chat room, I'm going to kind of depend on comments from the chat room to help fill in the gaps, because even though I'm the world's foremost authority on all this stuff, some of you know more than I do. So be glad to have you jump in on that. And I um, got a little video of uh, my summer vacation. And, <laughs> well, not really. Uh, <laughs> and um, then George has an awesome video that I've been privileged to see in advance. Uh, so you want to stay tuned to the end of the show for Smoke and Solder. George, you want to tease that a little bit? Yeah, tonight I'm going to build a speaker, and I don't mean I'm going to uh, take out the saw and cut a hole in a box and stick a speaker in it. I'm actually going to build a speaker. All right. Uh, and I've seen it. It is you don't want to miss it. You want to stick around for the end of the show. Let's kick things off with a news update. Find out what's going on out there in the world of ham radio. Here's Don Wilbanks and Newsline. From the Amateur Radio Newsline, these are the Ham Nation headlines for October 11, 2011. The FCC has released a study detailing some possible steps to ensure reliable communications for first responders in times of natural or man-made disaster or any form of communications crisis. Technologies mentioned include small unmanned aerial vehicles that fly to an altitude of 500 feet and support a single frequency band for cellular services, weather balloons acting as repeaters to carry multiple frequencies longer distances, high altitude long distance unmanned vehicles providing a greater payload at specific locations, and suitcase systems placed on low flying aircraft to be used as repeaters. This deployable aerial communications architecture could be deployed within 12 to 18 hours following a disaster. Its minimum goal will be to restore necessary lines of communications for a period of 72 to 96 hours. Benton County, Missouri Amateur Radio Emergency Services was called in to provide communication support early in September after a cut telecommunications cable isolated the Johnson County 911 Center in the town of Warrensburg. Benton County hams working with their counterparts in Johnson County quickly established reliable communication so that 911 calls could be handed off to Warrensburg officials for dispatch. About 15 calls were transferred, and the amateur radio operators handled at least one life-critical situation. Radio amateurs remained on duty until the local telephone company fixed the cable problem the next day. Johnson County Emergency Management Director Gloria Mikalski referred to the ham radio operators as awesome. If you're a ham radio operator in Alabama involved in emergency communications, listen up. The annual ABC 3340 Storm Spotter Training, known as Storm Alert Extreme, is coming to the Birmingham Jefferson Civic Center Saturday, November 12th. 
Brian Peters, WD4EPR, who has qualified over 6,000 Alabama storm spotters during his days with the National Weather Service, will be doing the instruction. All existing sky watchers are asked to attend for their annual retraining, and anyone that wants to join the team needs to be there as well. This severe weather training event is free, and there is no need to pre-register. Again, the date for this free severe weather training class for residents of Alabama is Saturday, November 12th at the Birmingham Jefferson Civic Center. For details on these stories and more, point your web browser to www.arnewsline.org. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW. Now back to Ham Nation. And thank you, Don. And a reminder, Newsline in its entirety, which last week I said was 40 minutes, but it's really more like 20 minutes. Heard on repeaters around the country. Look for a repeater near you or dial them up on their website and you can hear the whole report. Uh, so, awesome. George, we got some uh, some mail and some announcements and news of our own. Uh, you want to kick off our uh, our mailbag here? Yeah, I'll kick it off. We got an email here uh, that Bob forwarded to me. It says, hello, Leo, Bob, Gordon, George, and Gary. Gentlemen, I've had a dream of being an amateur radio operator ever since grade school when my Uncle Don let me build a radio and smoke up the house with it. <laughs> Anyway, he uh, also wanted to be a DJ and a rock star and uh, ended up in the uh, United States Marine Corps and became friends with the Mars station operator there. Got married, had kids, uh, then uh, got into the Boy Scout programs and learned about Joda. And I believe you're going to tell us about something on that in a moment. Anyway, he's been a Leo fan since the screensaver days. And uh, when he saw Leo getting his license, he decided he had to get his. So anyway, congratulations, Daniel, K-8-D-A-W, on your new license. And he's a man after your heart, smoking up the house, uh, <laughs> getting involved yep. in ham radio. Half yep, he's, uh, he's doing good for you. Well, let me do what You got one or two more, right? Uh, yeah, but why don't you take Let's one do a, and I'll... Yeah. A Brown ping pong Rock. game, yeah, that'll work. Uh, we talked about ham fests uh, quite a bit at the last uh, on the last Ham Nation, and I got an email from VK2ARE Ed down under. Oh, I was going to turn my camera upside down for this. Takes planning. Uh, he says the Central Coast Field Day. Now we know what we think we mean when we say field day, but if you're in Australia and a lot of parts of Europe. A field day or a radio rally is their name for a ham fest. So they don't call them ham fests down there. Anyway, it's in Wyong, which is about an hour north of Sydney in New South Wales. It's their big annual ham fest. It's, here we go. It's, um, it's going to be on February 26th next year. Now we're announcing this well in advance because a lot of people travel around the world to come to this ham fest. So you might think if, you, if, if Australia has been a destination, you know, possible destination for you, someplace you thought about going, well, maybe a ham fest, big ham fest is another good reason to go. So um, we're giving you plenty of advance notice so you can get uh, a trip planned. So it is on February 26th in 2012, just outside of Sydney, Australia, and uh, their big ham fest. Um, number two here, um, I get all kinds of interesting uh, tips and tidbits from, uh, from hams out there. Greg, W7HRC, uh, I think in the Seattle area, has clued me in to something called a reverse beacon system. A reverse beacon system. Well, what is that? You send out a CWCQ on some bands, and there are some receivers that are set up online to give you a signal report. It's a great way to find out what band is open to where from you and how your signal is making it. They've got an easy website. It is reversebeacon.net. Reversebeacon.net. And just stop by there. It, I, when I looked at it, it, it took me a little while to understand what was going on. So spend some time there. But if you can operate on HF and send out some CQs, on CW. It doesn't work on phone. It has to work on CW. It's, it's done with a bunch of CW skimmers and connections to the internet, things like that. But it's designed to just pick you up wherever you are and uh, show you what stations are hearing you and how well. So a real, real cool deal. Well, George, let's uh, go for your number two. Okay, my number two here is from Andy, AC5AL. 
And he wrote, uh, greetings from the First Church of the Ladder Line. And I guess that's a comment from when we talked about uh, RFI a few weeks back. He says, George, I enjoy smoking solder every week. I love the long tractor power segment, but where are the hand plates and the Texas bug catcher on the tractor? Well, <laughs> in Mississippi, you don't have to have plates on your uh, tractor, but the bug catcher had fallen off. That's the reason it wasn't on. A lot of vibration on a uh, tractor. It's probably yeah. the problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, Henry, KB3PXZ. Shout out to Henry. Henry was watching episode 16, which was our show on uh, the Eris satellites. And he said he was able to hear Arasat 1 making a pass overhead while he was watching us talk about it, which is pretty awesome. He says uh, he loves the, oh, how cool is that? I love the show. Keep up the good work. He was, he must have been watching the download because uh, Arasat wasn't going overhead while we were doing the show live. But lots of people watch on the download. So um, what's next? Oh, Pacificon coming up this weekend. Well, you've been hearing a lot about that. I was listening to Leo's show, The Tech Guy, uh, over the weekend. And as he closed out Sunday's show, he was talking about being at Pacificon next week. And Alex, can we dial up the Pacificon website? I'm not sure I gave you that one in advance, but it's uh, Pacificon, P-A-C-I-F-I-C-O-N dot org. Dot com takes you to some business. So Pacificon.org. Let's we'll see if Alex can get that dialed up. And once he's there, look down the left-hand side for forums and events. And we'll, we'll just kind of graze through the, uh, the stuff in the forum. They have a ton of stuff going on. The Hamfest is uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it's a three-day Hamfest. Gordon was telling us it's not your usual flea market ham fest, although I noticed that they do have some flea market type activities, but it is mostly set up as seminars and forums and just a ton of them, all kinds of things going on simultaneously. It's going to be hard to choose which one you want to go to. It's in Santa Clara. It's this coming weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I don't know that this is the highlight. I'll say it's the highlight because I have to kind of suck up to Bob uh, or to Bob and, and Leo. The highlight will be Leo's live broadcast of the tech guy on his 160 or so radio stations and here on uh, twit.tv um, on Sunday from 11 o'clock till 2 o'clock uh, Pacific time. I think that would be... Uh, yeah, two until five Eastern time. So Leo's going to be doing the tech guy from the show. Now, he, I think he's going to do a lot of ham radio stuff on the tech guy, which is really just awesome for ham radio. Um, he probably can't talk about ham radio the entire time, but uh, uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of it. And we love when ham radio gets some publicity in the general media and you know, the tech guy is general media. It's heard by all kinds of people, just like a Twit TV is. So it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to just sitting here and absorbing the whole thing as it's uh, live on TV. So that's next Sunday, 11 o'clock Pacific, 2 o'clock Eastern. And you guys in the middle of the country, you can kind of do the calibration. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. And uh, like I say, he talked about a lot about ham radio and about Pacificon on last week's show. So maybe that's going to drive a lot of people to Pacificon that uh, wouldn't otherwise have been there. And that will be awesome. And finally, George, in my notes anyway, um, coming up this weekend, in addition to Pacificon, is Joda, the Boy Scouts Jamboree on the air. And I understand that uh, you have some experience with Joda or something that you would like to talk about, uh, George. But what do you know about Joda? Uh, I know that it's jamboree on the air, and that's about it. <laughs> I <haven't laughs> okay. been boys I'll put you on the years. spot. Sorry. But I do have an email here that uh, Bob had forwarded. Uh, they were uh, promoting Joda, and uh, they created a special uh, QSL card for it. And if you go on Google and uh, just do a search for J-O-T-A and frequencies, you can find out what frequencies Joda will be on. And uh, they're operating on uh, most of the HF bands as well as VHF and Echo Link. And are they on D Star, Gary? I think they are planning on using some D Star. Alex, could you do a Google search for us? Just uh, Google up a J O T A. Um, 
And uh, and I think we'll see there. Yeah, okay. There's the frequencies for Goda for Joda, um, and that's on HF. They are going to use uh, D Star, Echo Link, and IRLP. And what I can tell you about that, because I was doing some some uh, searching uh, during the day today to see where they would be, and and what they said, and what makes a lot of sense is they're not going to be any one place. Because if all of the Joda operations tried to be on one reflector or one conference server on Echolink or IRLP, well, it would just be Bedlam because those are one-at-a-time operations. So if you're involved in Joda, you've probably already done your homework and you have some conference servers staked out or some, uh, some repeater nodes staked out that you're going to be on and, and be able to make contacts on. If you're a ham who's interested in just participating and they really want hams to talk to the scouts, there'll be a fair amount of scouts talking to scouts and that'll be cool, but they want hams to talk to scouts too. They're interested in as much communication as they can get. Then uh, if you want to do that on HF, you've seen the frequencies and you can look them up. Just, just Google uh, Joda frequencies and it'll come right up. But for Echolink and IRLP, you're going to have to do a little bit more research. There's a lot out there and find out what node or what repeater or what server that uh, you want to be on to be able to listen and probably help out and make some contacts with Joda. Um, I've listened to Joda operations in the past. And, and George, I, I got to say, hams sometimes have an awkward job of talking to scouts. So I've got some yeah. suggestions. And maybe you, some of you guys in the, in the chat room have some suggestions on, uh, on how to do this too. Um, the hams, when they start talking to the scouts, they get a little bit tongue-tied and they're not sure quite what to talk about. So my suggestion is that you ask them something that they can answer easily in a couple of sentences, but not something that's so simple that they could answer it with a yes or no, because that's going to go no place. It's going to be right back in your lap and you're going to have to think of the next thing to say. So don't say, well, do you like scouting? Oh, yeah, I like scouting. Boom, you're on to your next question. Um, ask them something like, uh, what's your favorite scout activity? That will get them talking for a few seconds and get them a little bit past the mic fright that a lot of people have when they, uh, when they first talk on ham radio. So that might help out. Let's see. Okay, talk about merit badges and how long have you been a scout? What was your last merit badge? Uh <laughs> Is Joda a Star Wars convention? No. Joda is Jamboree on the Air, Boy Scout on the Air convention, or Jamboree. Um, and my last suggestion is don't try to turn them all into hands. I know we want everybody who t t touches a ham radio to say, I want to become a ham. How do I get my license? Well, that's not realistic. That's not going to happen. Maybe there's a few of them when they get to play with it a little bit and talk to the hams that are there at their operation off the air that will indicate an interest in learning how they can become a ham or at least learn a little bit more about it. But for most of them, it's just an introduction. This is cool. And we need more and more people to at least know about ham radio, even if they don't want to become hams. It'd be good for them to know what ham radio is all about. Why? Well, one of them one day is going to be your neighbor. You want to put up an antenna I want your neighbor to be happy about the idea. So they've had that positive introduction to ham radio. Maybe when it's time for you to put up the antenna, they'll say, that's cool. I don't mind. Anyway, that George, that's uh, my thought. <laughs> Maybe they'll help you put it up. Yeah. Maybe they'll handle the soldering iron. Yeah. Go ahead, George. Well, I've got an answer here to Gordon Stumper from last week. He had asked the question, what frequencies did the original Sputnik satellite transmit on? And the answer is 20.005 megahertz and 40.002 megahertz. He said that he couldn't remember whether the first one sent slow dits or did it send dit, 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 which would be HI for high, which in uh, ham speak is sort of like uh, saying ha ha. Anyway, he said it was uh, like laughing at us from space. Yeah, I think, and I didn't do the research on this, and I should have. I think that, that the first, um, the Sputnik just sent dits. I think it was an Oscar that sent high. 
So I'm not, ah. not real sure about that. But, I mean, that was pretty rudimentary in those days. So, But very cool. And that was, what, 1964, I think, or so? Oh, I don't um, know the date. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah. I was, I was a little kid, not really paying attention, but I was, I was pretty young. So, uh, okay, once again, I've uh, lost track of where we're supposed to be in the show. We've done our email. We've done our intro. We've done our news. We've done our stumper. Ah, it's time for, well, um, you know, Let's let's take a moment to uh, to try this YouTube video that uh, that I found. Uh, we we saw Bob in the pre-show, and Alex is going to stick Bob and and Joe in at the end of the of the video because they were in the pre-show. And and uh, for those of you downloading, you really ought to watch the pre-show. <laughs> Come on, live on Tuesday nights, eight forty-five Eastern or so, uh, six four or five forty-five. Uh, uh, Pacific time, because the pre-show is where the fun part of the show is. This, this part, you know, it's all scripted and we're stilted and it's dull. So uh, you really want to watch the pre-show. Um, we saw Bob in the pre-show, but Bob was over in, uh, in uh, England and Europe uh, attending some ham conventions. And a fella over there uh, caught some video of Bob at the National UK Ham Fest and Alex, can we bump up that YouTube and maybe skip through it a little bit? Uh, you, you can just kind of at random look at a couple spots until we get up to that spot that I flagged for, uh, for Bob at about five minutes. So this was uh, provided to us by M0OGY. And Alex, is that going to work? There we go. Good, huh? Bob Hyle, who makes the microphones that I use in my shop. That's great. Many of your mics, I've got about four of them. You're having a good time? I am, mate, yeah. It's a nice. Are you? Enjoying nice it? ham fest, yeah. It's like, really, really uh, good. Californian weather here, isn't it? Yeah, we brought it with us. <laughs> yeah, okay. You have. Yeah, thanks, mate. I, sh I should have brought my short sleeve shirts and my shorts, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, very un uh, unlike UK weather here. Well, that's okay. We're glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, it's good to many. see you. Yeah, same to you. All right. Uh, my name is Dave M0OGY. Okay, from Dave. North Lincoln here in the UK. All right. Well, yeah. thanks a lot. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. There you are. There's the, the call. Good day. nine eid You got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, All right. Got video, Bob. Thank you. Right, so that's another one. That's Hamfest. The third Hamfest 2011. New at showground. Still a lovely day. It's just gone four o'clock. They're closing the doors. It's on tomorrow, on Saturday. Yeah, there's a big right. tower. Excellent. So a quick look at uh, Bob Heil in the uh, National Ham Fest in England. And um, I thought that was going to be our only opportunity to get Bob on one of the past three shows. And actually within the, the content, within the body of the show, that turns out to be correct. Bob has not abandoned Ham Nation. He'll be back next week. Gordon He's actually is also the off this week. <laughs> Say hi to Bob in the chat room if you're here live. Um, uh, uh, Gordon is also off tonight. Let's see. We're going to see a little bit of Bob. Um, yeah, they're missing Bob and Gordon. Gordon will be back. He, Bob, uh, Gordon is getting himself ready for Pacificon. And uh, Leo is on vacation this week. He'll be wrapping up his vacation with Pacificon. So that's why it's the George and Gary show tonight. Uh, and we're, you know, we're just muddling through the best we can. So, um, George, I'm going to move on to the video of what I did on my summer vacation at the National Electronics Museum, unless you've got something you want to interject here at this point. No, I think that's appropriate, and uh, it's not really your vacation, is it? For Leo, it's his vacation. Uh, for me, no. Yeah. Uh, I was up at, well, actually, it gets explained on the video. So, Alex, let's push the big button. Thank you. So, Cliff Broughton, W4FT, and I were up in Baltimore at the uh, Digital Communications Conference for Tapper. And we went out to lunch, and we passed by this building that had all of these uh, radar antennas. And then we noticed it also had some ham radio antennas. So we decided to check it out. Turns out it was the National Electronics Museum. Now, we had never heard of it, so on Monday, after the conference was over, before we headed back to North Carolina, 
we decided to stop by and see what it was all about. We figured from all the antennas that ham radio would play some part in this museum. Turns out it was a pretty big part. Welcome to the National Electronics Museum. I'm Les Jamison. My call sign is WR3X. Our tour began with the good old Jacob's Ladder. Then Cliff got a lesson in how electricity is generated. You made the exercise. And we moved on to radio, which is a big part of what the museum has to offer. We heard a few words from Marconi. On December the 12th, 1901, that I placed the single earphone to my ear and started listening. The chief question was whether wireless waves would be stopped by the curvature of the Earth. The first and final answer to that question came a closed circuit when I heard We ordered a pizza over the telegraph. You should be sending American Morse. I don't know American Morse. I'm going to send international. That would be a large pepperoni and cheese, please. Well, the pizza never came, which may say something about my sending ability. So we looked at some old military equipment. I was particularly intrigued by this cutaway view of a mobile installation. I'm a big fan of operating mobile, and I'm glad things have gotten a little bit smaller. I'm pretty sure this truck doesn't get very good gas mileage. I was also impressed by this really nice exhibit of an early ham radio spark station. I've seen spark equipment before, but I've never seen it assembled in what I'll assume is a really authentic looking station. That's amazing. A receiver, a transmitter with no tubes, no dials, no readouts, no displays. I only wish it could actually operate so I could see it and even more importantly hear it to see what ham radio sounded like in those days. I know spark was a really broad signal and there wasn't really any tuning. I mean everybody was kind of mixed together on the same wavelength. They didn't even call it frequency. And I've heard recordings of spark but I've never heard what it would sound like actually to be operating on the air and I'd love to be able to hear that. I guess we'll never really have that opportunity. The museum has an extensive modern ham radio station as well. It wasn't operational at the time of our visit. It seems to be a manpower issue. And that seems to be a problem with a lot of museum stations. There are some good ones that are still operating, but there are quite a few that have fallen by the wayside. Maybe the most famous is the station at the Smithsonian Institution's Museum of American History, which went off the air a couple of years ago. If you've got an operating museum station in your area, maybe you want to think about supporting it a little bit more. The museum isn't huge, but you can easily spend several hours or more looking through all the exhibits. There's a lot of radar and satellite stuff in addition to the communications equipment. It's well worth your $3 admission. It's in the same building as North of Grumman, so I guess you can see where a lot of the support comes from. It's not too far from the Baltimore airport, so if you're gonna be in the Baltimore area, you might wanna plan on stopping by the National Electronics Museum. Tell them Ham Nation sent you. Well, that was great, Gary. George, that was just a, a, a totally random find. We were heading out to lunch, and there was this building with all these, the first thing we saw was all the radar antennas. And then I caught out of the corner of my eye because there was a lot of trees around it, the, look, what looked like a tri-band beam. And uh, we drove back and looked a little carefully, and, well, it was loaded with ham antennas, the ones that you saw in the picture. Um, and so we came back and, and took our self-guided tour on, uh, on Monday, and, well, what a cool little find that was. So if you're going to be around Baltimore, you want to check that out. It's a lot of fun. Only three bucks to get in, so, you know, it's a token fee to uh, just help them maintain the place. Uh, George, let's uh, remind people what's coming up in Smoke and Solder, and then we will get on to what radio should I buy. <laughs> okay, tonight when we get Smoke and Solder, it's going to be me at my first attempt ever to build a speaker from scratch using uh, just junk I had around the shack here. And we're also going to give away that Vectronics uh, soldering course kit that we ran a contest on last week. So that's coming up in just a few. Did you get a winner? I uh, got about 22 winners. Now I've got to draw <laughs> one out of the hat over here. 
and uh, we'll do that after smoke and solder. All right, excellent. All right, well, so here's the deal. Over the past couple of shows, Gordon keeps getting questions from people asking how they program a radio. And he keeps saying, well, the dealer should program the radio for you. And, uh, and you should get the radio pre-programmed and ready to go, which is not a bad idea. It, it would be nice if a dealer would at least program a few of the local frequencies for you. He got some pushback from at least one dealer and from others who said, no, it's a good idea. We do that, at least some local uh, frequencies. But you need to know how to do some of your own programming and find the frequencies. So I'm going to talk about that. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what radio you ought to buy. So this is what radio should I buy, a, uh, the UHF VHF FM edition by KN4AQ. And Alex, we can start sticking up those slides here. Is that going to work? There we go. The first question on the next slide, handheld or mobile slash bass? Good so, question. Yeah, almost everybody starts with a handheld radio. I'll grab a handheld here. What the heck? Let's grab two. Almost everybody starts with a handheld radio because they're convenient. You can carry them around. You can use them, or at least you think you can use them just about any place. Let me check with our peanut gallery. Uh, did you buy a handheld radio first? He bought a handheld radio first. Um, Cliff, did you buy a handheld radio first? Yes, Cliff did. bought a handheld radio first. Almost everybody buys a handheld radio first because it seems like they'll be the most convenient. You can listen every place you are. The problem with a handheld, of course, is this tiny little antenna and the relatively low power output means that you can't talk from anywhere you are, especially inside a car. It can become a little bit difficult. And it's battery operated, and although today's lithium-ion batteries give you a lot more battery life than the early days of uh, nickel-cadmium batteries, um, it's still somewhat limited, especially if you talk very much. You run out of battery pretty quick. So what people do with handhelds is the first thing they do is they get a magnet-mount antenna, and they take the antenna off, and they screw in a magnet-mount antenna, so that somewhat helps the signal problem because inside a car with a rubber duck, you got to be pretty close to the repeater to be able to make contact. Um, so that works pretty well. And then they can plug it into to shore power, the car power, cigarette lighter, to be able to operate without killing the battery. And then to make it a little bit more convenient so you're not holding the radio, they get a speaker mic. And I call that putting a radio on life support. So you stick all that stuff on the radio, and you drive three blocks to the 7-Eleven and get a Slurpee. And you don't want to leave your radio in the car when you're going in to get your Slurpee. So you take the antenna off, put the rubber duck back on, unplug the speaker mic, unplug the power, go in, get your Slurpee, come back out, connect the mobile antenna again, connect the power, connect the, um, the speaker mic, drive three blocks home and take it all off again. You get tired of that pretty soon. Some people recommend getting a mobile radio first. Oh, I've got some back here. Yeah, a couple of mobile radios back there. Um, I'm not sure which I'd say. I, everyone gets a handheld first. Just be prepared to want to get a mobile radio pretty quick. Um, let's see. What's our next question? Oh, okay. Uh, next slide. Mono band or dual band? Mono band's just two meters. So do you get one that's just two meters? They're going to be a little bit cheaper, either handheld or mobile. Or do you get a dual band, and typically the dual band is going to be 2 meters and 440 or 70 centimeters. George, have you noticed the, the odd way we refer to, the, to the, our two most popular VHF, UHF bands? We call 2 meters 2 meters. We never call it 144. Yet we call 440 440. We never call it 70 centimeters. I, I'm assuming that, that those are the common uh, words in use in your area as well. Uh, pretty much, yeah. You always call it uh, UHF here. Some people will call it uh, 440, but nobody calls it uh, 70 centimeters very often. You were talking yeah. about the choice of a handheld or a mobile. Well, I'm the oddball. I bought a mobile first. I was used <laughs> to working on uh, 20 kilowatt uh, transmitters and 5 watts. Just didn't seem like enough for me. Well, but see, you had the background to know. 
which way to go. You, you weren't operating off of emotion. Um, okay, so uh, two meters or dual band. There, there are a few mono band UHF radios, but, but not very many and not really enough to, to, uh, to be concerned about. Uh, the reason to buy a two meter only radio is no reason at all. There's no reason to buy a two meter only radio. The dual band radios are only a little bit more expensive and they open you up to a whole extra set of repeaters. There are actually more UHF repeater in most areas than there are VHF repeaters. Now, it's true, two meters is the prime time band. It's where you're going to find the most activity in most places. So probably, uh, assuming that you kind of spread yourself out and go where the action is, most of your time is going to be spent on two meters. But it's good to have 70 centimeters in your pocket. And you may discover that 70 centimeters is where you want to spend most of your time just because of the repeaters that are available, the people that are talking on them, and um, uh, you know, coverage or whatever, whatever reason, you may find 70 centimeters is where you want to be. A, a dual band radio is about 50% more expensive than a mono band radio. So it's not that much more expensive. What are we getting from the chat room here, Cliff? Oh, we're getting <laughs> <laughs> tons, tons of stuff here. Um, oh, somebody's asking about 220. Found nothing on uh, 220. Got, got my handy talk. He's all sitting in the way of my monitor here, so I can't, uh, can't see anything. 220 is a very lightly used band, unfortunately. I was going to say that in addition to dual band radios, there are multi band radios. There are some that have 220. In fact, this one here, this Kenwood uh, THF6, is 2 meters, 220, and 440. Uh, ICOM and Yesu both have some radios that have 6 meters, 2 meters, and 440. So you have some other choices, but 220 and 6 meters, very limited in terms of the number of stations that you're going to work. So unless you've got a special reason to want to get one of those radios, then uh, a 2 meter 440 dual band is, is what you want. Although I happen to be a 220 lover, and I would like to see you on 220, but realistically speaking, not a lot of activity there, so you've got to be somebody who just wants to go there. So we've made our choice for dual band. Next question is, uh, well, let's see, we have a second. Um, Ray from ICOM and N9JA is telling me that two meters has a little bit longer range. 70 centimeters is a little bit shorter, which is true, uh, but it's good in a city because the 70 centimeter signals bounce around a little bit. In fact, if you're going to operate with an HT with a rubber duck in the car, 70 centimeters will work better because that, that shorter wavelength will get through the aperture of your window better than two meters well, and you'll hit the repeaters better, even though for the long haul, two meters will give you a little bit better range. All right, so we've decided to do a dual band. Um, the next question on your dual band is UBOT or TUBOT? And, well, I've given it away on the slide here, George. I don't suppose you've ever heard those terms before. I've never heard it put that way, no, but uh, <laughs> for me, two bands at a time. Yeah, I, I invented those terms, and I'd hesitate to use them in here, but I put them in a QST review that I wrote. So they've been introduced to the mass ham media already. And, and by the way, since I invented them, I can decide how to pronounce them. Ubot, one band at a time. Tubot, two bands at a time. A one band at a time radio is a dual band, but only lets you operate on one frequency at a time. You can switch at will from two meters to 70 centimeters, but you can't, uh, can't do both at once. A two-bot, it actually should be a two-fot. You got to pronounce that very carefully um, because it's two frequencies at a time and they can both be two meters. They can be two meters and 70 centimeters. And um, why would someone want to do that? When I talked about doing that, and, and that, by the way, is my preference, like you, two at a time, a, a radio that displays two frequencies and can listen to two frequencies at once is my preference. People keep saying, well, Gary, how can you listen to two frequencies at once? Doesn't it get confusing? Well, first of all, no. And second, typically one of them may be making some noise and the other is quiet. You can monitor your favorite repeater or whatever repeater you want to keep tabs on all the time. And then if that repeater is not busy, if it's not entertaining you and you want to hear some other activity, you can dial in any other repeater or scan the band and catch whatever other activity there's on. And 
your local repeater becomes active, you can turn down the other band and listen or pick which one you want to hear. I can hear both at once, one of two ways. Either two speakers, some of the radios will have two speakers and one speaker for one band, one speaker for the other. It's a little spatial diversity. Or just by adjusting different volume levels. It's surprising that I can have one a little louder, one a little softer, and I can still pick which one I want to concentrate on. No, I can't actually absorb both conversations at once, but I can pick which one I want while they're still going on. Um, let's see. Yes, you can, uh, a question from the chat room. Can you listen to two frequencies in the same band at once? Most of the radios can do that. Just two VHF, two UHF. It's plenty easy to do. We are running as, as, as much late as I thought we would, George, and maybe even a little bit later. So I'm not going to get to programming a radio tonight. Just it not done. Sound we'll like it. That's a, a long time. Rest of this real so. quick. Yeah, it is. So we'll hold that off to another show, and I will be doing some more shows uh, later on this year. Um, but we'll we'll wrap this one up. What features are important? Well, there's a lot of features that are important, and these radios are feature laden. We have had feature creep in ham radio. There's lots of things that you'll hardly ever use. But if we can put up the what features are important slide. Um, there are some things that every radio's got. Uh, clearly, um, every radio's got tone. Um, mostly we use CTCSS, continuous tone squelch. Some, some hams know it as PL, is a, a Motorola trade name. And they all have a touch tone or dual tone multi-frequency, DTMF. But the stuff you want to look for that might differentiate one radio from another are the number of memories that it's got. Some radios have 100, 200 memories. Some radios have many, many more memories, and some have a bank system to help you concentrate memories in specific banks. Um, and I think just about every radio these days has an alphanumeric display, which is very handy when you've got a lot of frequencies programmed. It's hard to remember what they are just by frequency. So an alphanumeric display is to program in something about what the repeater is. Some radios give you characters, which I find kind of limiting. Some radios give you eight characters, and that X2 characters makes a big difference in, the, in what you can put in your alphanumeric display. So my, I'm not sure that that's you know, like a go-no-go -no -go on one radio versus another, but it's something to throw in the mix. Be sure you find out how many characters you can put in the display. Uh, Lithium-ion battery for handy talkies. Well, just about all of the newer radios have lithium-ion batteries. That is really extended our operating time. Um, most of them will receive all day long now and, uh, and receive conversations going on you know, a good percentage of the time, 10 20% of the time. Uh, not have to be squelched all the time, and you'll still receive. You can't talk for two hours on any of the batteries. If you're going to talk that much, you'll need a couple of batteries or shore or mobile power. Um, receiver coverage and sensitivity. Sensitivity is inside the ham bands, not a big deal. All the receivers have excellent sensitivity inside the ham band, not a differentiating factor. But if you like listening to the activity that's outside the ham band, the public safety, uh, business band, those bands are, are adjacent to the ham bands at the 150 megahertz range and the 450, 460 range. A lot of radios these days will hear 800 megahertz as well. Um, if you've got an interest in that, you want to look at the specs for the radio very carefully to see what that radio is going to cover because they're big differentiation from one radio to another. And just because they say they cover it doesn't mean they'll hear it very well. Some of them, they may be able to show it on the display. But they'll be pretty deaf and won't be able to hear things very well. So you want to see what the sensitivity is like. Um, you might be interested in some special modes. For those of you that are just getting started, these won't mean very much. But there are a handful of radios out there that do APRS and a few ICOMs that do D-STAR. And if you know you've got an interest in those. Well, limit your search to those radios and see what they can do for you. And finally, yeah, I've tossed in programming options because programming is a uh, uh, not a difficult thing, but it helps to be able to program these radios using a computer. So you want to make sure that if you're going to be programming stuff into dozens and dozens of memories, you don't want to be doing it by pushing buttons on the front panel and turning dials. You want to be... Uh, able to program it by, uh, by a computer. I think just about everything these days 
is capable of being programmed by a computer. So where do you find out more specifically about these? Because I'm not going to tell you exactly which radio to buy. I'm giving you some guidance on which way to go, but you've got to do your own research on what to buy. Well, there are reviews. QST runs regular reviews, a couple in just about every issue of QST. And uh, uh, a uh, you know, Truth in Advertising, I write reviews for QST. I've had several in there, and we'll probably have several more. CQ also has reviews, and I think Gordon has uh, written about a lot of radios in CQ. And a good place to go look for information about radios is eham, uh, eham.net, the website. They have reviews. The reviews are written by you, the radio user. So this is one of those caveat emptor things. You kind of have to look with a, a careful eye at the reviews that are being written. A lot of people will fall in love with the radio and say nothing but good stuff. A few people will may have had a bad experience and they'll just trash it. So look across a range of reviews on Eham and kind of get your average. You know, toss out the best, toss out the worst, and like to do in the Olympic do the Olympics. No, some athletic contests. Toss out the worst, toss out the, the, the best, and kind of go for the average. And you'll probably get a pretty good idea of what a radio is really like. Um, and advice here is to avoid what I call candy talkies. There, many of the manufacturers have at the bottom of their line a tiny radio with low power, half a watt or less, and no touch tone pad. Uh, these radios are typically cheap. They are very small, but they are low power. Now, a typical radio's maximum power is going to be about 5 watts. They'll have a medium power position perhaps at, at a half a watt. Uh, ICOM's got some that are at the 2 watt level, which is a real sweet spot for power level. Uh, but these radios will be a half a watt or less, a couple hundred milliwatts. And that is, you'd be frustrated using a radio like this because the power is not enough to be able to let you get very far from a repeater system. People will be telling you that you're noisy all the time. So you, you probably don't want to start with one of these. And they also don't have a touch tone. So you can't um, activate repeater functions. Uh, there's not so much auto patch going on anymore. They're available a lot of repeaters. It's a good backup in an emergency, but most people have cell phones. But repeater functions are typically activated by sending touch tones. And without a touch tone pad, some of the candy talkies let you program in uh, a string of touch tones that you can send as a pre-programmed string. That's sort of useful, but still pretty limited. So there are some good reasons to have a candy talkie. They're great at a ham fest or a field day or some other event where the range is going to be short. You want something that has good battery life, doesn't need a lot of power, very small and light and easy to tote around and, and use, but you don't have to get a lot of good coverage. So a candy talkie is not your first radio. Might be your second radio, third radio, not your first radio. And then finally, the killer. George, new or used? What do you think? Uh, if it's your first radio, I'm thinking maybe new. Yeah. Used is a problem. Uh, you can get a bargain, but you're buying a pig in a poke. You don't know whether the radio has been abused, whether it's working. I'm sorry, some hams will tell you the radio is working great, although watch for this weasel language. Well, it worked really well the last time I used it. If somebody says that, run as fast as you can. Uh, you may get a good bargain. So if you're going to buy a used radio, best to buy it from a local source, somebody that you know or the people that you know know, and has a reliable reputation. You could still end up with a problem. Now, the worst possible thing that could happen is I sell a radio that I know worked fine. I hand it over to you. You use it for a day or so and something breaks. We both feel terrible. I didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. It's just one of those things that happened. But what do we do now? So be aware that those things will happen and save yourself 25, 50% off the price of a radio if you're willing to take those risks and put up with the consequences. So, George, those are my recommendations for what radio to buy. Let's see. Uh, no reason for any radio to have a thousand memory channels. Wrong. Lots of reasons. 
Um, I'll talk about reasons for having lots more memory channels whenever we can get around to program a radio. I have a thousand memory channel radios, and they're almost all full. And I really enjoy it. Let's see, what else? Credit card radios. Yeah, credit card radios is what I'm calling the candy talkie. Uh, that's the real tiny radios. Alenco uh, had some that were smaller than small. They were as thin, not quite as thin as a credit card, but very thin. Um, and, and once again, they're, they're good for that, that local use at a ham fest or a, an event, but not where you've got to be able to reach out and, uh, and talk to a repeater. Um, so I think I've used up more than my share of time. And we are running into our, almost running into our overtime because you got a few minutes for what we have been promoting as the best part of the show tonight. I guess I better give it to you, George. Well, let's get right on to it since we are running behind. And when we come back from Smoke and Solder, we'll give away that soldering course kit. This week on Smoke and Solder, we're going to attempt to build something I've never made before. It's a simple electromechanical device called a speaker, which I'm sure everyone has. But I've never built one, so this is going to be a new experience. I was thinking about the materials that I would need. And in particular, the cone. Uh, you know, cones are made out of paper. Some are made out of plastic, aluminum, and various other materials. And while I was trying to decide what to use, I was enjoying a beverage. And I decided, why not try this paper cup? So that's what we're going to attempt to use first. We're going to need some stuff to go with that. Of course, we're going to need uh, a magnet. Uh, this one's probably a little bigger than what we need. but it's what I found. And we're going to need some wire, and I've got a coil of some real fine gauge wire here. I'm not even sure what gauge that is, but it's uh, probably a little heavier than, than what I see on most speakers. The magnets I chose to use are a 1 and 8 inch ceramic magnets that I got at Radio Shack. There's uh, actually five in the pack, but I have three here, and that's about three quarters of an inch tall, and that's probably more than we really need for this project. Since I'm using three different magnets here, I was a little concerned that I might end up with three magnetic fills. So to rule this out, I took a hard drive magnet and moved it up and down the outside of the magnets. And it seems to be more attracted to the ends and not particularly to the joints in the middle. So that was a good sign. And just to be certain, I tried the test again using a paper clip and got the same result. Now I needed to combine the three magnets into one, and I decided the best way to do that was to slide them up on this screwdriver where they fit real tight so that I could ensure that they would all be in line when I got finished. And then I put a little super glue in there between each of the magnets and allowed it to dry. The magnets are glued together well now, and they're in a good straight order. But I did run into one problem that I had not anticipated. My magnetic screwdriver no longer seems to be magnetic. It doesn't want to hold the bit in, so now I'll have to remagnetize my screwdriver. Our next step is to make the voice coil. So we're going to take some 110-pound index bond papers and cut a strip here that's three quarters of an inch wide and then we'll cut another strip that's a little bit wider than that. Now we'll wrap the wider strip of paper around the magnets and tape that down. This will be used as a temporary spacer. Next we'll wrap the three quarter inch sheet around being a little more careful with it because this will be where our voice coil is actually wound. Now we'll remove the two pieces of paper and pull the spacer out, leaving our voice coil form. And this slips over the magnets with plenty of slack. If we had 32 or 34 gauge wire, then we'd probably need about 50 turns to come out near 8 ohms. However, this wire is a little larger than you'd normally find on a speaker, and I'm not sure of the size of it, but I know it's larger than 30 gauge. So we're just going to have to wrap around some turns and then take a measurement and see where we are. We'll stop and apply a little bit of super glue every now and then just to help keep our voice coil together. I've wound about 30 turns on here now and we'll take a measurement and see where we're at. Boy, we've got a long ways to go. We're only at one ohm. Well, I wrapped and I wrapped and I wrapped and I've got several layers of wire on here now. 
and this measures 4 ohms of resistance. That's not the same as 4 ohms impedance, but for a speaker, uh, it's a pretty good indication that we're close. So we're going to make a 4 ohm speaker instead of an 8. I did a little experimenting off camera, and I've decided rather than this paper cup, we're going to go with a plastic cup because we're not looking for fidelity, we're looking for volume. Every speaker has a basket that holds a cone. Well, in our case, for our recycled material speaker here, we're going to use a super large box of Honey Nut Cheerios. Not only will this provide us with a sweet sound, it can also help lower cholesterol. Says oh, so right oh, on the box. Oh, oh. I had only intended to use three magnets for the speaker, but we're going to put two more on the bottom just to hold the magnet up higher. The voice coil will go on top of that. And then our plastic cup speaker cone will fit on top of the voice coil. Well, you get the idea. We'll glue the voice coil to the bottom of the cup. And then we'll suspend the whole apparatus with rubber bands. I've marked what I believe will be the center of the cone where the voice coil should go. And we'll glue the magnets down there. Now we'll position the cone and the voice coil over the magnets and we'll stretch out the rubber bands and we need to determine some way to attach them so that we can adjust them easily we don't want the voice coil or the cone to bottom out so I'll use some alligator clips so that we can easily adjust the length of these rubber bands it seems to be suspended to where the voice coil is not bottoming out and it's not scraping against the magnets either time to connect the speaker wires now so we'll bring out our soldering iron and melt a little lead. I've got the speaker connected to my amplifier now, so let's listen to a little bit of last week's Ham Nation on our do-it-yourself speaker. The forum there at the Pacific Con. Um, I believe I am on tropospheric ducting, as well as I'm the Saturday morning. Good morning, and uh, we've got some exciting uh, audio that we're going to play. Hair-raising audio on that Saturday morning to get everybody reared up and ready to roll. I've seen uh, some of your forums at Dayton, and, uh, you know, hams... Our speaker obviously works, but let's have a little fun now and analyze its characteristics a little bit. Right now, I'm feeding in 1 hertz, and we don't see any movement. Let's increase that to 5 hertz. And now 7 hertz, it starts becoming active. And at 9 hertz, it completely jumps off the magnet. There's 20 hertz. That should be the lowest audible frequency for humans. Now let's do an upward sweep of frequencies and see how it behaves. Watch the VU meter at the bottom of the screen and you'll notice that some frequencies seem to be louder than others. These are the resonant frequencies of the speaker. All the dogs in my neighborhood are starting to howl. My cats all just ran out of the room. The speaker seems to be loudest right in the 700 hertz range. Let's pay attention to the other frequencies that peak the VU meter and see how they're harmonically related. George, the chat room is going nuts. Yeah, there will be no smoke with this. Well, this, this part is the most compelling Once television I've seen. past 2,000 hertz, the volume really starts dropping down fast. By the time we're to 3,000 hertz, it's way down, so that's as far as we'll measure. A speaker is a transducer, and so is a microphone. So could we use this speaker as a microphone? One, two, three, four. Hello. 
check, one, two. This is W5JDX, talking on a Dixie cup. Well, it's not that good a microphone. <laughs> and for that matter, it's not that great a speaker either. Now, I was talking with my friend Jim. You remember Jim. I didn't hit it very hard. Let's see. He said he had read where some hams were building speakers tailored to the 600 to 800 hertz range just for use with CW because then that would eliminate all the noise and you would only hear the tone that you were trying to hear. This speaker seems like it might just work for that being that it's resonant at 700 hertz. Now before we leave, there's just one more test that I wanted to try. <laughs> While the results were far from high fidelity, at least we did prove that you could build a simple speaker at home using common materials. Join us again next week for another Smoke and Solder. George, I, that was awesome. That was a really awesome demonstration. Uh, that was a lot of fun, Sorry. Gary. I wasn't supposed I had to be to on camera. that last part. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the, the chat room just went crazy. They lo best smoke and solder ever. No smoke, no solder. Best smoke and solder ever. So yeah, if you looked real hard, you'd see a little bit of solder and smoke in there, but only when I soldered the wires together. Well, last week we said we were going to give away this uh, Vectronic soldering course kit that uh, we got from MFJ, and we're going to. You had a stumper question for that, right? Uh, yeah, the question was, uh, there was a, a famous line, don't forget to drink your Ovaltine. And uh, what famous ham wrote that, or where did it come from? A lot of people guess Little I Orphan know. Annie. And uh, yeah, it had something to do with Little Orphan Annie. But what we were looking for is a Christmas story, which was written by a famous ham by the name of Gene Shepard, K2ORS. Uh, he narrated the, the thing, too. He was Ralphie, I guess, as an adult. But uh, he has a lot of great uh, stories. Of course, he's passed on now, but if you do some search around the Internet, you can find some of his old radio shows. He talked about ham radio and a lot of them, so uh, definitely worth the look. And we're going to give this away now. We had uh, 22 people come up with the correct answer, and I put all the names in a hat here. And we're going to shake it up a little bit. I'm going to reach in and grab one. The winner has to come pick it up at your house in person, right? Uh, I'll mail it out to them. <laughs> okay. Just want to winner, scare people. Yeah, the winner is Frank from Salem, Wisconsin, KC9LZB. So, Frank, uh, I've got your address here, and uh, we'll be getting this out to you right away. Uh, thanks to everyone who entered, and I don't know, maybe we'll come up with something else to give away one day and do something similar with that. And, and Frank, we want you to videotape yourself making a uh, project and send with that uh, kit and send it to us. We expect to see you again on Ham Nation. All right? Is, is that a fair deal, George? Uh, that's a fair deal, and uh, I'm sorry, no sound effects for the hat unless you listen real close here. I can but, hear it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we got a winner, and we had a lot of fun tonight, Gary. Maybe, uh, maybe everybody will slip out again, and we can do this sometime. That was great. Awesome, George. Best smoke and solder ever. So I believe we are wrapped up here. Oh, um, let's check. Yes, smoke and solder. There's something in our rundown called gear buzz. I have no idea what gear buzz is, but we don't have, whatever it is, we don't have time for it tonight. So... Uh, Maybe Bob can explain what that is uh, next week. Um, and I have had a great time for the past three weeks hosting Ham Nation. I'd like to thank Bob Heil for giving me the chance to do that. Bob will be back next week along with Gordon. And I think you'll see uh, Gordon, maybe maybe Gordon will be able to sneak in over the weekend on a little bit of uh, the uh, the tech guy. But Leo Laporte will certainly be on, on the weekend on the tech guy. So you want to check that out. He'll be live from the Pacificon Ham Fest this Sunday from 11 o'clock until 2 uh, on uh, Pacific time, 11 to 1 Pacific time, uh, 2 until 5 Eastern time. So the, that'll be on uh, twit.tv on live. It'll be on uh, 100 and some radio stations uh, across the USA. And you won't want to miss that. It, it ought to be a lot of fun. 
because I'm sure he's going to be talking about ham radio quite a bit. So the Tech Guy Show with Leo Laporte, W6TWT, coming up this Sunday, live from Pacificon. I want to thank Alex Gubble and Lin Fu, our uh, technical, technical director and producer for the show tonight. There's Alex. There's Lynn. Thank you, guys. Uh, no call signs to list with them yet. I did say we shouldn't try to talk everybody into becoming a ham, didn't I? Well, maybe we'll attract them. Um, thanks to Bob Heil for letting me do the show. Thanks to uh, Leo Laporte and the Twit Network. Thanks to Cliff W4FT for monitoring the chat room and tossing those nuggets to me this evening. Thanks to you, George. I uh, appreciate your being on the show here tonight. Well, thanks for hosting for us, Gary. When these uh, occasions come up that Bob's out of town, I'm sure there's going to be some more. As a matter of fact, I know that there are. Are you ever going to get a night off, or are you just kind of stuck here forever? Uh, you know, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't really worked out the details on that yet. <laughs> uh, surely sooner or later I'm going to have to have a night off. But uh, I've got a little stuff in the can here, so we'll always have some smoke and solder. Well, I can tell you one thing for sure. You don't want me to fill in on smoke and solder because it would be a disaster. But I, I am the world's greatest appliance operator, but I am not an engineer. So thank you, George. Good night to you. Good night to everybody out there listening. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. Ham Nation is now off the air, and I'll give you my traditional tagline. Over and out. <laughs> 73. Look who I found out in the hall. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Who, who is that Hi. scary looking guy? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, it is what a pleasure. Hey. How are you? I am great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. We're uh, you, you gonna, getting ready to doing go a on show that, tonight. On, yeah, for show. Sure. We're in Austin and we're getting ready to play in about an hour and 20 minutes, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So is this pre-makeup and hair or post-makeup and hair? You know, I, sorry, I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob is my uh, my uh, makeup consultant. That's right. Of course. Yeah, of know, course. He's getting me all my up and all. <laughs> I, I have a suggestion. One word. Kiss. What? Kiss. <laughs> kiss, kiss makeup. <laughs> Just for tonight. Just tell him I said to do it. More my wife does. That's that. right. Thank God. That's right. Thank God. That's why I look so good. How's it going on that end? We're having a wonderful time. George, how are you doing over there? I'm doing fine and uh, great to meet you, Bob. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you back on Ham Nation another night. That's that's Joe. That's Joe. Joe. Oh, Joe. Yeah. Why did I say Bob? Yeah. <laughs> well, nice You're starstruck. Me. You're just, you know. Yeah. Well, first night I. I'm not on the first uh, evening you're on that I'm not on stage. I'll get on and sign in. Are we too bright? A little oh. bit. Yeah. There, there you go. There, that's, that's, that's better. better. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Cool. So is this a solo gig for you? Yes, it is. It's and you can carry off a work. whole show? <laughs> well, we're going to find that out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I have I'm no manners, Bob. Singing. I'm sorry. I'm not used to singing everything. I'm used to taking turns, but yeah. Yeah. tonight we'll see. Uh, we'll see. I guarantee you you all of you, he can <laughs> handle this. We've been there before, and he can handle this. Yeah, he's got. Do you have a, a North Carolina show on the schedule? Raleigh. Raleigh. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because that's where I'm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Raleigh in about a week, and you can talk to Bob about. Uh, all relevant details. Uh, yeah, because I'm in Raleigh. Yeah, oh, great, cool. Oh, we'll be see you in a week. There you go. All right. That works out pretty good. Yeah, that was sleep <laughs> <worth it. laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I, I want to get out of here because he's got to get dressed. I didn't expect to have him on, but we wanted to say hi to everybody, and uh, we miss all the Ham Nation crew, and we'll be back and uh, see what goes on. In the, I'll be in there in about a week, and Joe's got about a month on tour here, but we'll get together. Yeah. So. Joe, keep thank the, you for stopping uh, by. Keep the filaments lit. Yeah. Oh, watch, be sure to watch the opening. Watch the opening of the show, Bob. Okay. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Very Joe. good. Right. Greetings, everybody. So long. <laughs>